Thanks. Uh, so thanks for having me today. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about some research I've done with, uh, with some of my former colleagues from Mississippi State University, looking at uh, collaborative resource management in the fisheries industry in uh, the Gulf Coast, specifically um, looking at, so I should acknowledge my collaborators, um, Matt Freeman, who's an economist, uh, David Hoffman, an anthropologist, Ryan Shoup, political scientist, and uh, Joseph Witt, who's a, a scholar of religion. Um, and so specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of story of Vietnamese American fishers on the Gulf Coast, um, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana specifically. So I'm not going to be able to speak to uh, Florida and Texas, which do also have large Vietnamese American fishing communities, but have a quite different kind of um, context in that they're more urbanized than the other three states. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of stakeholder engagement policy around fisheries in the US uh, and the context of citizen science, because what I'm going to talk about today is what uh, I've come to call stakeholder science, a form of citizen science as stakeholder engagement or um, in, uh, way to build relationships between state and federal agencies and uh, fishers in this case, which is a new way of thinking about both kind of collaborative resource management and thinking about citizen science in a different, a different way. So why Vietnamese American Fishers, well, Vietnamese Americans make up about 80% of the Gulf Coast shrimping industry specifically. So shrimping is the largest component of the Gulf Coast fisheries economy, and it is dominated by Vietnamese Americans now. They're about 30% of all fishers in Louisiana, 50% of all fishers in Mississippi, and about 50% of all fishers in um, Alabama. And the region and fishers in the area have experienced kind of multiple disasters and disruptions in recent years. So a number of uh, major hurricanes in the area, Hurricane Rita, uh, Hurricane Katrina, as well as the BP Macondo oil spill in 2010, and increasing competition from uh, cheap imports of shrimp primarily. Um, and so we started this research because I was working at Mississippi State and some extension agents from Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant actually reached out to uh, my collaborators and I at the university and said, so this was about three years post BP spill, the Vietnamese American uh, community is still struggling uh, hugely. We are struggling to engage with them and to provide support that they might need. Please, please <laughs> come down, do some research, help us figure out how to do this better uh, because they were seeing a community in crisis, right? And they wanted to kind of um, figure out what to do. So part of that crisis is a massive exit from the industry, and that's also part of the story of why Vietnamese Americans are now such a large proportion of the commercial fishing industry in the Gulf Coast. There's not actually been an increase in the number of Vietnamese American fishers, but there's been a decline in the number of other fishers. <laughs> so uh, white fishers they, on the Gulf Coast, um, culturally people say Anglo, Fishers, so I often will use that wording. That's the kind of regional language that's used. Um, so Anglo fishers have exited the industry largely. African American fishers have exited the industry at high numbers. Vietnamese Americans have stayed in the industry. So, yeah, a huge decline post uh, BP, mostly. So yeah, we kind of started this study saying, okay, so what's the relationship between these state and federal resource agencies? So we're looking specifically at NOAA, Sea Grant, um, and all the state departments of marine resources, state departments of health, and what is the relationship between all of those agencies and Vietnamese American fishers? 
And does that relationship fulfill the kind of requirements, policy or legislative requirements, of cooperative management and the spirit of cooperative management? So um, what I'm going to talk about today is just a little bit of our work uh, identifying what those barriers to stakeholders' engagement are that we've identified, um, as well as the potential for stakeholder science or citizen science to serve as a facilitator of stakeholder engagement. So, okay, in the U.S., there's a legislative mandate to engage with stakeholders in fisheries management, um, and I'll talk, talk a little bit about that in a second. So there's a legal framework requiring that fisheries management engage with um, stakeholders, but there's also increasingly in the kind of natural resource social science world an emphasis on the potential for cooperative management, co-management, stakeholder engagement, all these different varieties of thinking about uh, engaging and collaborating with stakeholders. There's an increasing emphasis on that, uh, uh, those opportunities as ways to achieve better social, environmental outcomes um, across a variety of sectors, including in fisheries. Um, so there's both a kind of policy framework for stakeholder engagement and this the movement in the literature to emphasize non-expert-led resource management and collaborative resource management. So and on the policy side of things, in fisheries, the collaborative framework is outlined by the MSA, the Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act. It was first created in 1976 and then amended in 1997 and 2006. And the MSA sets the framework for all federal fisheries policies, pol uh, policy in the US. And it, so it has this kind of existing tension between uh, a desire to achieve what they quote, call, quote, maximum yield from fisheries with uh, a desire to achieve conservation and management long term of fisheries resources. So it's supposed to create the kind of policy framework to achieve those things. And they talk about a lot <laughs> the use of the, quote, best, best scientific information available from both social sciences and you know, fisheries ecology to make those decisions. They talk about stakeholder engagement specifically in section two of the MSA, which outlines the goals of the policy, and, and they talk about, um, yeah, so I just pulled a couple quotes. So the MSA says that their goal is to enable the states, the fishing industry, consumer and environmental organizations, and other interested persons to participate in and advise on the establishment and administration of such plans, meaning fisheries management plans. And they primarily um, prescribe doing this through regional fisheries management councils. So there are eight fisheries management councils in different regions of the US. And those are supposed to be comprised of persons engaging in the harvest or processing of fisheries resources in that region. And the act also says uh, that conservation and management measures should take into account the importance of a fisheries resources to fishing communities in order to provide for the sustained participation of such communities, right? So it creates this the formal legislative um, framework for stakeholder participation and formal legislative requirement for stakeholder participation, right? So these federal, so NOAA the Na, uh, and the National Marine Fisheries Service in NOAA is legally required then to engage with stakeholders in um, making these management decisions, as well as states. Right? You can see it also outlines that state resource agencies are supposed to do that. But whether that happens in practice <laughs> is the question, right? So um, we've been doing this study for five years now, which seems like forever. <laughs> it's a mixed method study. Started with some focus groups um, with a little, you know, two thousand dollar pool of money. Did some focus groups, and then from there, expanded to do interviews with agency staff in all three states, as well as the federal agencies interviews with uh, a number of community groups, including religious communities. And then, for the past couple of years, have been working 
very hard <laughs> to do. It's actually a little bit higher than that now. I should have updated this. We've got like 328, I think, face-to-face -face surveys that are done on fishing boats <laughs> all across the three states. So it's a lot of time. Hiring and training bilingual survey administrators. Um, and then going boat to boat at every dock, <laughs> trying to uh, recruit fishers and deckhands to participate in our survey. It's a lot of work, and our translators work exceptionally hard. <laughs> um, so uh, looking like the industry, our, our survey respondents look basically like the industry at large, which is to say that there's predominantly shrimpers in the industry. And in our survey, so 94% of our respondents are shrimpers, 10% oysters, crab, and fish and longline. So those add up to more than 100 because people do more than one. <laughs> and uh, we have, this is really, so this is really why we did the survey in this face-to-face -face quota sampling method is because we wanted to get those deckhands included in our survey, right? So, and we did, um, and we're still collecting surveys. I'm going down to the Gulf Coast, not next weekend, but the weekend after, because um, next weekend's Easter, so no one will be on their boats. <laughs> so uh, we couldn't use, for example, like a preset list of fishing licenses for a number of reasons. First of all, people hold multiple licenses, so they hold federal and state ones, multiple at a time, where their boat and is is not necessarily like linked to where they hold their license. They, there's no easy way to determine somebody's um, racial or ethnic background from those licenses, right? There's no um, kind of, and, and it doesn't have any representation of non-owners, non right? So we wanted to get data from non-owners as well. They are important stakeholders in the industry. They're not on those licenses. Um, there's also the MSA requires citizenship to be a captain of a commercial fishing vessel in the U.S. So if you're a non-citizen, you can't own and captain your own boat. Um, so we would be excluding all non-citizens if we were to use that sampling frame, which is problematic. So, so yeah, like, uh, here's the big funding. Yeah, there's very little engagement. Spoiler. Uh, not that surprising, maybe. If you look at those, uh, there are 21 subcommittees of the Gulf Coast Regional Fisheries Council. There's not a single Vietnamese American currently serving on any of those 21 committees, right? So there's very little uh, engagement and, and a pretty massive failure of this kind of two-way engagement that's idealized within the literature and within the policy. Um, but more specifically, we kind of identified some key obstacles to that engagement and some key opportunities for improving the engagement. Specifically today, I'm just gonna talk about the citizen science component. So we do the surveys on tablets with like a little hotspot, but occasionally the tablets don't work and so we have to go old school paper, <laughs> which is that one. Um, okay, so perhaps unsurprisingly to social scientists, the biggest barrier <laughs> to this idealized stakeholder engagement is still language, right? So the vast majority of Vietnamese American fishers have little, uh, very limited or no English language um, skills, and there's this long-term problem with a lack of translation from both state and federal agencies. So um, one fisher said, for example, another thing is at those meetings, they never had an interpreter, never had an interpreter. They do sometimes have a translated brochure, right? But the agendas and everything, the policies and regulations, they don't have. Um, someone from an agency says, I would say there's a difference in that we don't target the Vietnamese community specifically. We've included the Boat People SOS, this is a community group, to try to get information to them and to those seafood shops, but we don't currently translate anything into Vietnamese or anything like that. So this is what someone from the Alabama Department of Marine Resources, about a minute after telling me that at least 50% of their fish holder, if their fishers are Vietnamese American, and then she says, well, but we don't translate anything into Vietnamese. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, it would be really wonderful if we could put out every bulletin, the newsletter, out different languages, but there's a time crunch with that and an expense to have it translated. So the agency staff just say, this is not 
not possible for them to do. There's some federal regulations that might say they are legally required to do that, but they're not. Um, so we asked in the survey some questions about language, and when we asked, thinking about your relationship with these agencies, how important is it that face-to-face -face communication take place in Vietnamese, 74%, so it's very important. Um, when we asked about written communication, 73% said it was very important. Um, one Fisher said, for example, when I get a, a, a document in the mail in English, it might as well be blank paper. Okay, it doesn't mean anything to me. And overall, when we asked about what the biggest challenges were to communicating with of the variety of state and federal agencies, the majority of Fisher said language, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, read a question. Yeah. Okay. I guess those people came to America by the end of the Vietnam War, their ancestors. So it seems that throughout three generations before. Yeah, there's more. The, 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 the Vietnam Americans, they still have some uh, uh, lack of the language. Yeah, so there's multiple waves of Vietnamese immigrants. So there were two big waves. So immediately following. Um, the, the, the war, right? Mm -hmm. But then there was a, another large wave of Vietnamese immigrants uh, in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And so there's differences. There's heterogeneity, I would say, within the Vietnamese American population. But for the most part, um, so really, so I, I originally started this project talking about Vietnamese immigrant fishers. But the community members have told me that they identify very strongly as Vietnamese American. But mo um, Virtually all, so 98% of the fishers who we've, in our survey, were born in Vietnam. So these are not folks who were born in the US, right? These are, um, yeah, yeah. They're, and they're an aging population too, right? So age is part of this. Uh, it's, yeah, it's people who are original, who are immigrants. It's not the children. Uh, it's not a first or second generation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in addition to language, Fishers and agency staff both talked about an, uh, a barrier um, because of a lack of trust, uh, mutual respect between Vietnamese stakeholders and uh, both state and federal agencies in the area, and in particular, a fear uh, of kind of fear-based and punitive relationship between the state and federal agencies and, and the, the fishers. So, one community leader said the other thing is that they've lost a lot of hope and faith in the agencies because they make promises and nothing has really panned out. So she's lost a lot of faith and trust in them, the agency system. And a staff person, an agency member said, and even this place, I've been here for a number of years, a lot of people still distrust. The agencies never trust them, the confidence in their government, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, they don't think their government can help. Um, and in particular, a lot of fishers spoke about a relationship between state and federal agencies that was built primarily on punishment, right? So, um, uh, I think I can just say it, this is an Alabama Department of Marine Resources staff person who said, our only division that really interacts with the Vietnamese is enforcement, right? So, um, fishers know that, right? We, they only talk to us when they're giving me a ticket. <laughs> um, and then an, a fisher said, there's some fear as well, particularly to DMR, Department of Marine Resources, because they give citations. So some of the fishermen, they have this fear of, well, if you speak up too much, retaliation, you know, we're complaining too much, why don't they go out and pursue us on the water and give us a ticket, right, for something we supposedly violated, some law or regulation, some law or regulation which we didn't. So that's the fear they have. Um, so yeah, Fisher's talked a lot about this lack of trust of these uh, agency staff and a fear that um, they would be punished. So you know, they talked about after the BP spill, I only found out that an area had been closed to fishing when I went into the area and then I would get a ticket and that's how I find out that they had changed the boundaries, right? Nobody's proactively engaging with them to tell them of these sorts of things. And that slide somehow ended up in there twice. So <laughs> when we asked about levels of trust in the survey, uh, we found 
not great levels of trust, but overall the highest for Coast Guard, um, which is maybe not that surprising. They're the ones that are providing emergency relief services. Um, although, in terms of the language, Fisher's talked a lot about fear, about language barriers with the Coast Guard because you know, there's emergencies and you have to call for help and if you're not comfortable speaking in English and the Coast Guard only speaks in English, so they would tell these stories of, you know, someone had a heart attack and it took three hours for the Coast Guard to uh, respond because they had to go find somebody who spoke Vietnamese to answer the call and then that person finally got there and, you know, this man had had a heart attack three hours ago. There's also an issue of outreach misfit, misfit as both state and federal agencies increasingly rely on um, social media and tech to engage with stakeholders and the digital divide that exists um, between fishers and the agencies. So one staff member said, we use local TV as well as information on our website, social media pages, you know, social media became more prevalent. We use Facebook and Twitter to communicate with the community. Uh, someone else, another agency staff person said, it would be nice if we could put these bulletins out on paper. They all go out electronically anymore. The press releases that we put out or print media that we put out, we have the website that we try to point people back to. So a lot of the information, I think, the majority of this is in English. A lot of times we have a list of contacts when we are putting press releases for Facebook or Twitter postings, right? So it compounds this language barrier when resources are only provided electronically. So there might be a newspaper announcement, but the newspaper announcement will say, there is a new regulation, go to this website, <laughs> right? Yeah. And a, a community, Leader said, so because their background, meaning most of the fishers is Amerasian, they don't have an education even in their own native language, but actually the people around here, they are not graduated more than high, more than high school, but less than that, maybe, you know, three, four years of school. Um, and one, this is one of the staff people who originally invited us to do this project <laughs> said, I wouldn't put stuff online for the, for example, uh, the v for the Vietnamese community. I know that would probably be a waste of my time, right? So there are some staff at the agencies who are aware of this uh, outreach misfit problem, um, but they don't have necessarily the time or money to solve this problem that exists. Yeah, and one of the fishers then saying, a Saturday afternoon, instead of having everything on the website, do more dock sides. This is what they're talking about, what they would like to have. Uh, like passing out handouts, which they practically uh, haven't been practically doing that much. They don't spend a lot of time at docks and harbors posting things. Um, someone who is working to engage says, because of the difficulty in getting the Vietnamese fishermen into those meetings, over the years we've sort of migrated back to dockside and one-on-one -on -one interactions. It seems to be a much more effective way to reach out to the Vietnamese fishermen, sort of in their workplace, on their boats. So, right, there are agency staff who are trying to work to overcome these, these issues. Uh, when we asked fishers what their preferred way of communicating with state and federal agencies was, um, unsurprisingly, it's not <laughs> electronic. So, in Alabama, not a single fisher said that they had a preferred either text messages or emails to communicate with any of the agencies. Uh, in Louisiana, less than 2% preferred text messages, less than 4% preferred email. In Mississippi, no, no one said they preferred text messages and less than 2% preferred emails, right? So some of this is related to language, some of this is related to um, education, and some of this is related to age. So there is significantly older um, demographic, older group than the uh, average American population, right? So our average age of fishers is 54 years old. So there's this complex interplay of reasons why uh, it's not a good fit for them. So that's the sort of uh, depressing <laughs> failure of the 
idealized um, stakeholder engagement model, right? We hear like, oh, engage fishers, engage stakeholders. But uh, what we found is that there are some opportunities to improve that relationship, and there are some um, instances where both fishers and agency staff said things have gone well. And one of the surprising findings that we did not go in, we didn't ask anything specifically about citizen science, but it came up repeatedly through interviews and focus groups. Um, so what do we mean by citizen science? Usually researchers talk about citizen science as scientific resource, research conducted all or in part by non-scientists. So um, the extent to which those non-scientists are engaged in the research pro process is uh, diverse, right? It's not always the same, but it, it's any sort of research that in, involves uh, non-experts in the project or non scientists in the project, they are often experts. <laughs> um, and the goals of citizen science and the literature around citizen science has primarily focused on goals about broadening the data that's collected and the types of research questions that are answered. So there's a lot of talk about citizen science being a way to, to promote, uh, quote, undone science, right? So to answer questions about environmental health or things that are not popular with um, academic researchers, per se. And there's been a lot of debate within the citizen science literature and policy world around the quality of the data that's collected by citizen scientists, um, what that data could be used for, uh, how to improve that data. So that's kind of been the primary focus of the literature. Um, but we want to argue that there might be a new way to think about citizen science, and I call it stakeholder science, which is the idea that this stakeholder science can serve as a bridge, as a form of stakeholder engagement, as a way to build those relationships of mutual trust and respect that are lacking in stakeholder engagement right now. So in my paper, soon to be forthcoming, I think, <laughs> we have examined three projects. Um, I'm going to just talk about two briefly today um, that were both 2006 of post-Katrina projects, post-Katrina, pre-BP spill citizen science projects. Um, one that was targeting the shrimp and blue crab um, industries and involved a $30 million, so quite a huge, quite a large investment um, from NOAA. And then one that involved the oyster industry that was an even larger investment of, of nearly $50 million invested in uh, all three states. So those projects involved some but not all of the features of citizen science. So in both of these projects, the research design and goals were defined by the agency and university researchers, not defined by the stakeholders themselves. But so it was not the kind of fully citizen science model where stakeholders are involved in the actual design of the projects. But um, stakeholders were involved in the data collection, right? So they were the ones engaged in the day-to-day -day ecological monitoring process and restoration components, and they were paid for that time, and they. Um, were treated as experts and, and in their local knowledge and in their local industry, right? So it has some of the features of citizen science, not all. So one, Fisher says, um, so this is coming from a translator. That's why she's talking in second, in, uh, not in first person. They basically um, write, after the Hurricane Katrina, this is she remembers the time they had a good relationship with the agencies. So Hurricane Katrina really devastated the coast and impacted fisheries as well, right? So they were a part of the research program that the agency, that they identified local fishermen who had the proper licensed experience to help with the restoration work. Uh, one fisher said then, how else would you know where the shrimp is? Where has it gone? Has it died right? What happened to its habitat? So the fishers talked a lot about feeling like their local knowledge and experience was valued, right? I have important 
uh, experience and expertise to share with the agencies. This is a way of demonstrating that um, expertise to them. Another said, so he was basically remembering when he was part of the shrimp monitoring program, right? That was a great program because he, he actually had the information, right? The types of shrimp he caught and how much, and then he had to go on a trip of several days or whatever. He would turn the log books to the agency, right? They would come pay him later on in the month. So there were some fishers who worked on both projects, who were involved in both citizen science projects. So this is one. He says he worked on two projects. He worked on the oyster relay, five to six months. He relayed oysters from reefs in Biloxi to reefs that were damaged in Gulfport. They brought the less impacted oysters that were damaged in the reefs in Biloxi and had the fishermen relay them. And then he was also working on a shrimp monitoring program. So his boat every day would go out to the certain area. He would have to document really how much shrimp caught in a certain time, right? So um, Fishers really talked about these multi-year projects as a sort of golden age of their relationship with state and federal agencies um, and a time when they felt that they could they were trusted, they were trusted by the agencies and in return learned to trust those staff people um, and learned to uh, develop this relationship of mutual respect. And agency staff talked about this as well. So, yeah, um, this agency staff person was talking about, so what DMR, DMR did, for example, in the case of oysters, they hired fishermen to help them relay oyster shells. And so, so when DMR has a meeting to implement these strategies, they don't have a problem with people showing, they don't have to advertise, the word gets out, and they've got a line out the door waiting to get, waiting to get in. So even agency staff kind of recognized the important role that these um, projects had played in building those stakeholder engagement relationships. There was a lot of questioning from stakeholders so I can talk a little bit about if you're curious about why this hadn't happened post BP. So this is all post Katrina. It has not happened post BP. So, and I want to leave some time for discussion, but we really identify, we have a number of kind of obstacles that we've identified, but the three key obstacles in you know, this foundational language uh, communication issue, a lack of trust, and an outreach misfit. But uh, we identified also some key opportunities to improve that relationship. I didn't talk today about our other, oops, um, our other uh, major finding around opportunities, which is that community groups and community leaders can play an important role in, in mediating this relationship, as well as citizen science. And so really, I argue that this is a new way of understanding the role of stakeholder science, a new, a new role for understanding the potential of citizen science, that citizen science can be seen as a way of not just generating data, uh, but as a way of, as a form of outreach and stakeholder engagement itself, right? That citizen science can be a way of building those collaborative uh, relationships that are the foundation of, um, a kind of idealized stakeholder engagement model, right? And, and why this hasn't happened after the oil spill is an interesting question. Um, I, I hypothesize, I'm not an attorney, that this is largely due to the litigious context post BP spill. So after Katrina, you know, there was no, uh, there was no one being sued or blamed, <laughs> right? Uh, after BP, there were a number, are still a number of ongoing legal battles, and so that changes the kind of context for these um, projects. I think this offers an important extension to the literature on stakeholder engagement and stakeholder engagement policy, as well as the, the kind of literature on collaborative management that's largely been silent on issues of diversity and stratification amongst stakeholders. Um, we build on some work by <laughs> Sava Siddiqui and, and Julia that is, has looked at how 
collaborative management, uh, collaborative natural resource uh, policy can engage across diverse stakeholders. And so what they have found is that um, this, there are, that trust and relationships uh, or demonstrated trust is important to building those uh, successful collaborative structures across when there's diversity amongst the stakeholders and amongst the participants and that uh, you have to be, agencies need to be more thoughtful in how they structure these uh, um, systems because for the most part these issues of Diversity amongst stakeholders are, is not have not really been addressed within the literature, right? There's this kind of, you can see it when you read the MSA, fisheries communities as if there is a fisheries community and there's no diversity within that fisheries community or no um, stratification within that fisheries community. And you can definitely see it within the natural resource social science literature that talks about collaborative management or um, collaborative governance as if all stakeholders are on kind of equal footing when they're, they're not, right? So, so yeah, that's where we're kind of trying to engage. So, I believe it's, we need to put up some more fun pictures. 